back and family camp started and uh, it's, it's like, it feels like I haven't been here forever. So, so it's really good to see some of you. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. I'm trying to see if you're listening. Uh, if we haven't even met yet, my name is Vasily. I'm one of the pastors here at Union's Church, and uh, I'm excited that you are here. And uh, hopefully, we can we can have a fantastic time worshiping our Lord uh, together. Uh, a couple of things I uh, wanted to mention before uh, we dig into the Word of God. One is uh, I'm just very thankful for uh, God working through us over these past few weeks. Well, first of all, family camp. We had the most amount of guests and uh, people from, and kids attending that I remember before. Uh, I think we had close to 200 people uh, with kids who registered and came on different days. Uh, I want to also say that if you ask the kitchen, they'll tell you it was about 300 people. So we either had 200 people who ate like 300 people, or we really did have 300 people, it's hard to know. But uh, I would encourage those of you who haven't had a chance to come. It's a great time of fellowship and the church family serving one another. Kids are having a great time. So praise God that, uh, that, that it was such a blessing. And then we transitioned straight to VBS, and I'm very thankful to God for that. Thursday and Friday was VBS. I'm excited about VBS because it's one of the events that we do as a church where we can invite people from the outside. You know, we, we have this tendency, if, we don't, if we're not intentional about it, we tend to do things for ourselves. And uh, what, what makes me excited is that this is one of the events where we can invite people from outside of the church, whether they're from other churches or they're just part of the local community. That's really cool. Uh, we had 104 kids register. 104. That's the most we've had compared to last summer. And get this, only 43 of those kids were children or grandchildren of our church members. You guys hear that? Two-thirds of the kids who were here were not part of this church. And that's really awesome that we're able to serve our community and serve and serve people from outside of the church. That way. So that's exciting. Thank you to all the volunteers who made it possible. Praise God for that. So let's let's open our Bibles to Acts 9. But Saul, 
still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them down to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him to the by hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple of Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on me, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples of Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. We're going to stop here for, for, for now. We'll continue the study of the book of Acts and specifically the story of Paul. But as you see here, this is a story of Apostle Paul's conversion. This is he, him meeting Jesus and changing in a profound way. This is something that has impacted many, many generations for many, many, many years. We were introduced to Paul at the end of chapter 7. At the end of chapter 7, if you remember, uh, I believe it was about a month ago, we have studied the death of Stephen. And uh, there is a story where Stephen is proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah. He is testifying about who Christ is. And the people take him outside the city and they're about to stone him. And they take the outer garments of the people who are going to stone him and they lay it down at their boss's feet. That's somebody who's supervising the whole thing. They're laying it down at the feet of Saul, who is also known as Paul. So who's Paul? Paul is the same person who's known uh, as uh, Saul of Tarsus. Uh, he is one of the most influential leaders of Christianity, or what has, what, what, he becomes one of the most influential leaders of the followers of Jesus. He has a Hebrew name, which is Saul, and then he has a Latin name, which is Paul. And uh, there are two different explanations as to how he became known by Paul. 
One, uh, uh, some people believe that he was renamed as such after his conversion. Others are uh, believing that this is just his Latin name versus his Hebrew name. But regardless of how he got that name, regardless of, of whether it happened at conversion or not, by the way, I, I believe that that's just his Latin version of the name because later on he was, um, he was called uh, Saul after his conversion 11 times. And so if he was changed over, he probably wouldn't have been called by his, his own name. But regardless of the reasons, he has two names that he's known by. He's from a, a city called Tarsus. Now, Tarsus is a, a regional kind of hub, a lot of commercial traffic going back and forth, a lot of people from different cultures, different backgrounds. It's a, it's a, it's a major population center in the province of Cilicia. And the city is just, just full of different kinds of people. We know about Paul that he was born a Roman citizen. He was of a privileged status within the Roman Empire. We don't know how he got it. Somehow his family has obtained it. Maybe it was through military service uh, because a lot of the Roman citizenships were given out that way. Maybe it was through some sort of uh, great act of service to the empire. We're not sure. But he has no problem in his letters to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews, relating to the Gentiles, relating to the Roman Empire, relating to the people who lived in, those, in that city. So it is possible that he got a Greek education while he was in Tarsus, but we also know that he was Jewish. He was of the tribe of Benjamin, and he describes himself as such in Philippians 3 that he is definitely Jewish. From Acts uh, 22, we know that he lived and was brought up in Jerusalem, and uh, most likely was in the Jewish environment. He studied after a, a very good Jewish rabbi, Jewish teacher, uh, and uh, famous Gamaliel uh, in Acts 22, 3 says that. And some historical records, by the way, uh, state that Gamaliel, uh, he uh, became a member of the Sanhedrin, which is kind of the ruling body of, uh, in Jerusalem there around the year 20 AD. So, all of that to paint a picture that Paul is very well connected, he's very well educated, he has a certain reputation, he has certain influence, and he's very religious. He's very devout. He's very much dedicated to what he believes. And the two things I want us to take away from this passage, from these 25 verses of the book of Acts, chapter 9, the first one is this, that God loves and saves even his enemies. God's offer of salvation, God's offer of redemption, God's offer of grace and mercy extends even to the people who were opposing God and who stood up against God and who have sinned against God in such a way that most people say, wow, that's pretty crazy. That's pretty messed up. He himself, in his letters, writes about his attitude about the gospel. Here's what he says in Galatians 1.13. For you have heard, he has a reputation, you all know, you have heard of my former life in Jerusalem. You know how I lived. You know what I did. You've heard about all that. How I persecuted the church of God. I pushed it. I controlled it. And I didn't just do it through laws. I didn't just do it through, you know, different politics. He did so violently. He was in charge of grabbing people and putting them to jail. He literally, when he was going to Damascus, he went to the high priest and got a letter. A court order would be the equivalent of what we have now. And he had the authority to arrest people and take them to jail because they were the followers of Jesus. He persecuted the church of God violently, and he tried to destroy it. He tried to destroy the followers of Jesus. He was the enemy of the church, and the enemy of the church is the enemy of God. He did not believe the gospel. He did not believe and accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was instrumental. He was convinced that this is a heresy, that this is a blasphemy, this is a group of some weird people who followed 
the rebellious rabbi named Jesus, and these people are committing blasphemy, and therefore they deserve to die, because they were blaspheming against God. He was very religious and very devout in what he believed. Most Jews would look at him as an example of the purity of faith. He is dead, he's uh, dedicated his life to keep the faith pure, to clear it out of all the imperfections and all this heretical stuff. It doesn't belong here. These people are blasphemers. Therefore, they deserve to die. While Jesus was dealt with on the cross, now his followers were left over. And so Paul is spending his life chasing the followers of Jesus. He's persecuted. He's arresting them. He's overseeing their executions. They have to be eradicated. They have to be removed. They, the faith has to remain pure. He hunts them. He arrests them. He throws them in prison and has them killed. All with the approval and the blessing of the religious people of that time. And so Stephen is killed. Stephen is killed and the disciples are dispersing. Some are running away scared. There's a big persecution against the church. But the good thing about that happening is that the gospel actually starts spreading out. It starts going into all these Gentile areas. And Paul is stopping to stop. He wants to prevent that from happening. So Damascus, uh, from Jerusalem to Damascus is a well-traveled road. Maybe the disciples went over there. Let's go check that out. Give me a letter so that when I show up to Damascus, I can arrest them. And so he goes to Damascus as an enemy of the church, as the enemy of the followers of Jesus. He's an enemy of God. Friends, when you persecute the church, you persecute you persecute Jesus. And on the way to Damascus, he has a miraculous appearing of Jesus to him. The people who are with him, they don't see anybody, but they hear the voice. Paul loses his eyesight. He doesn't, he doesn't, uh, he's not able to see as if it's a confirmation that something supernatural has happened there. And I'm not going to focus on his changeover. It's a well-known story. You all know it. But what I would like to, to focus on here is this. You and I might read this story, and you might say, well, you know what? I'm not as bad as Paul was. I didn't kill anybody. I didn't throw anybody in prison. There was a miracle that I certainly never experienced in my life like that. I was not driving an I-5, and Jesus just appeared in front of me, and I went blind for a while. That hasn't happened. This doesn't apply to me. In fact, I'm a, I'm a good person. I grew up in church. I did all the things. I followed all the rules. I was in a choir and a worship band, Sunday school. I did VBS whenever my parents brought me. Maybe you are the parent. Maybe you are the parent who did all the right things and brought your kids to every church event. And you give and you support and you do all those things because you are a good religious person. You didn't do anything crazy. And so you might think, this doesn't look like me. This is about Paul. He did some crazy stuff. Not me. In fact, God needs to focus on Paul and people like him, or maybe like Pastor Vasily, who has done a bunch of crazy things when he was, he was far away from God. Those are the people that God needs to reform. Those are the people whose heart God needs to change. Those are the people who need to experience that radical transformation. That's the kind of person who needs to have Jesus be revealed to him on the way to Damascus, on the road. That's not me. But the truth is, friends, that this story does apply to you and I. This story applies to every good person who tried to follow all the rules of life and who has not done anything significantly outrageous in life. Because there is a parallel between this story here and the story of the prodigal son. You guys remember the story of the prodigal son? Who remembers that story? Okay. What is that story about? What's that story about? I would argue that that story is less about the prodigal son 
And I would argue that that story is more about the love of the Father. The Father is the hero of that story. In fact, I would argue that that story is more of a warning to you and I when we look at that story and many of us, we associate ourselves with the prodigal son who squandered everything, who walked away from the family, disappeared, uh, just spent all his money and then came and asked his father for forgiveness thinking he is not worthy. But I would argue that most of us are more like the older son. Most of us are like the older son who is there with his father, who is doing all the right things, who is trying to earn the father's love, and who is trying to do all the right things and go through the steps of life. And we know that that's not a positive example in that story. And there is a parallel between that story and what happened to Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. Maybe you are the older son in the story of the prodigal son. Maybe you're a little bit like Paul, who did all the right things, who did what the father told him, who did what the teachers told him, who was righteous. Saul was righteous. He was fully devout, and he was very, very religious. He followed the law. Uh, in Philippians 3.6, he describes himself like this, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. He had passion to do what he was doing. He was a fire doing the right thing in his eyes for God. And the second half of that verse, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. He followed the law. He did it all the time when nobody was looking. He had certain integrity about him. He did the right thing that he thought was the right thing. He followed every rule every time. And he sincerely and honestly and with all his heart believed that he was pleasing God. That he was making God happy because God gave a set of rules for you to follow. Friends, you and I can be in the same danger. If you've been church, if you've been part of of a, of a religious institution for a long period of time, there is a danger. We've got to be careful because it is very easy for you and I to become convinced that my ways, that what I do, the way I do it are actually God's ways. It is very easy for us to start thinking that the way I do things, that's how God wants it because that's the way it is. My purpose is are God's purposes. That's what Paul thought. That's what the older son in the story of the father's son thought. That he was great in his father's love. His father's grace. That's what happened to Paul. But the good news, friends, is that God loves even people like that. Even people like you and I. Even his enemies, because every person sitting here today, at some point at least, was the enemy of God. At some point, you and I tried to define our own set of rules to live by, and by that, we rebelled against God, against His authority, against His purpose, and we did what we thought was right in our own eyes. And by God's grace, many of you have come to repent and know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and praise God for that. But we all were like that at some point. And maybe you didn't see a burning bush. Maybe you didn't experience the voice from the sky. But we weren't born again, and that's a miracle. We do have a new nature if you're a follower of Jesus and you look at things in a completely different and a completely new way, and that's a miracle. And God takes a broken and messed up heart, a heart that was as, as strict and as scandalous as, as, as Paul's was, and he transforms it just like he transforms your heart, just like he transforms my heart. And he leads us to being humble, to being loving, produces the fruit of the Spirit in us so that we can express our love and minister to one another and be a blessing to one another. Friends, even the most self-righteous hearts can be softened by God. And being self-righteousness is a 
trap. But we're all to watch out for. So the first thing I want you to remember from this passage is that God loves his enemies. God extends grace and love and mercy even to the people who were his enemies at some point. The second thing I want us to walk away from this, from this passage is that obedience to God will lead to ministry. If we are to be obedient to what he wants us to do, we are not going to be spending our time in inaction. We are going to be doing whatever God it is that whatever it is that God wants us to do. And at that time, there was no canon of the Bible. There were no 66 books of the Bible that were there for us to open up and say, okay, how did God reveal himself to me? At that time, God spoke a lot more directly to people through dreams and through angels and through, through direct appearances. But now, all we got to do is to open up the scripture and see what is it that God wants for me? What kind of person he wants me to become? What kind of things he wants me to fight and resist? What kind of things does he want me to do? Obedience to God leads to action. It leads to action. Have you ever experienced that in your life where you have this tug in your heart? You've got to go and talk to that person. My wife does that once in a while. I mean, oh, I have a feeling she should be that person involved. She has that. Some people call it intuition. Some people call it sense or whatever. I believe it's the Holy Spirit nudging us in different ways. God is speaking to us in such a way. Say something specific. Have some coffee with somebody. Invite them over to your house and share a story or two. Pray for them. Some sort of restlessness, some sort of call to action within us. There is a character in the story that we've read in the scripture called Ananias. And most of the story of conversion of Apostle Paul focuses on Apostle Paul and what happened to him on the road to Damascus. But the reality is, there is a very valuable lesson here in the story of Ananias. You see, God shows up to this follower of Jesus, this disciple, in Damascus, and he says, Hey, Ananias! And his response is very different from the response that Paul has. Paul said, Who are you? I don't know you. I'm not sure who you are. Who am I talking to? Ananias actually was very well aware that it was God talking to him, and he says, I'm here. God, I'm here. Use me. God, I don't know what you're going to tell me, but I'm ready. I'm waiting for you to talk to me. Tell me. Here I am, Lord. Here I am. He doesn't know what God is going to say next. He doesn't know what God is going to do or that he is going to put him in a pretty uncomfortable situation that he would be worried about. He doesn't know where God would send him. He doesn't know what that might look like, but he is responding to what God is saying to him in faith. That's why it's called a step of faith instead of a plan. God reveals the next step after you take this one step. And he'll show you the next one. You take that next step of faith, he shows you the next one. That's why it's faith. It's not a plan. It's not a contract. It's not a guarantee. God wants us to trust in every step of our life. And so God shows up to Ananias and he says, hey, you got to go talk to Saul. you got to go talk to Paul. There is this guy. you got to go talk to him. And so he is hearing this guy's name, Paul's name, Saul's name, and saying, isn't that the guy that came to this city to kill guys like me? This is the guy that was sent here to kill us, to put us in prison. I know who you're talking about, Lord. Are you sure that you got the right name and the right address? It does not sound right. You want me to go and talk to him? He pushes back a bit. Am I really going to show up at the front door of the guy who was sent here to hunt people like me? It's dangerous, Lord. I got family. I got bills to pay. I got a career to take care of. I got kids to raise. God says, go. Go. And I'm not supposed to step out in faith and be obedient to God. And he completed his mission of serving a man who was sent to kill him, kill people like him in that city. And he obeyed. 
He obeyed in serving a man who was supposed to be his enemy. And he comes to him and he says, brother. He says, brother. Can you imagine? Just a little bit ago, he was thinking of this guy by reputation. That this is the guy who is killing my, my brothers. And now he comes to him and says, you are my brother. Regardless of your experience, regardless of how messed up your life was, regardless of country you're from, regardless of language you're speaking, regardless of things that you do that might irritate me, you are my brother. Because the blood of Christ now unites us. Because you have gone through that transformation of the heart. You're a new person. He says, brother. Isn't that an incredible story? The former prosecutor of the church, the former enemy of God, is now a Christ follower. Friends, we, we tend to think that the gospel of Jesus Christ is only needed for the unbelievers, people who have not yet committed their life to Christ. But that's not true. We all need to hear gospel on a regular basis because that's the kind of thing that convicts us and that's the kind of thing that continues the transformation of our hearts because we all mess up, we all sin, we all make mistakes and we continue doing that. And we will continue doing that for the rest of our lives. Have you ever wondered why God didn't just, you know, snap his fingers and make us sinless once we believe? He wants us to trust him. A step of faith, one day at a time, one hour at a time, every time we make a decision, every time we choose, every time we make a decision on where to live, what kind of job to take, who to marry, how to raise our kids, whether to lie or not, He wants us to trust Him. And through His Son Jesus, God showed His love for us. Jesus is love of God as a person. He became a person. That's literally the love of God. That's the best way that God could show His love for you and I is through Jesus Christ. Now, the whole ministry of Jesus was about one thing. It was about restoring the relationship between you and I and our Father. We're going to participate in communion in a few minutes. That's what this symbolizes. This communion table is a symbol of unity in Christ and about what Christ has done, what love and personified has done in order to restore our relationship with God. And so my question for you, to each person here today is, how is your relationship with God? How is God? Are you listening to the Father on the road to Damascus by seeing what He's telling Are you and I spending time in His Word wanting to know what is the Father that you want me to understand about you today? About who you are, about who I am, about how to fight the things in my life. What's your story? What's your story of meeting Jesus? Might not be as compelling or as powerful as the story of Paul meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus. It might not be as, as radical of a turnaround. But friends, I want to tell you something. Your story of meeting Jesus and being changed and transformed is just as powerful, as important, and as essential as the story of Paul. Because the story of Paul's conversion is not about Paul. That story of Paul's conversion is not about how bad he was and how good he became. That story is really about the love of God restoring our relationship. He is the hero of that story. And if he's the hero of your story of meeting with God, it will be just as beautiful, just as exciting, just as motivating, just as encouraging as the story of Paul. And so, as we participate in communion here today, I'm, I want to ask you a question. Some of you have been church and religious and tried to follow all the right things in your life like Paul was. But maybe you haven't experienced the transformation. Maybe you haven't experienced the power of the Holy Spirit that Paul has experienced 
and that he went over and he couldn't contain it within himself, he immediately started proclaiming that Jesus is the Lord. Do you believe that Jesus is the Lord? You guys believe it? Jesus is the Lord. Say it with me. Jesus is the Lord. Jesus. Amen. Because you see, if the Holy Spirit fills us with that, with Himself, there is no way we can contain that stuff. It's got to go out. It's, we've got to share it. It's an amazing story about who Jesus is and about what God has done in our life. How is your relationship with God today? Some of you, you're faking it. You're fakers. I think that at some point in my life too, I, I went to church, I did all the right things, I wore the right clothes, I said yes to my parents, I did all those things. But the truth is I haven't experienced that transformation. Some of you are faking it. And you're really good. And here's the thing about faking that I've learned, is that the longer you fake it, the harder it is to break free from it. You gotta let that stuff go. You gotta give it to God. You gotta repent and say, Lord, I'm not enough. I've been faking it. Please forgive me. I want that joy. I want the power of the Holy Spirit in me, Lord. It's about you. It's not about wine. Some of you have never made that commitment in your life before. I want to give you an opportunity today. After we participate in communion, we'll have a closing song. I would love for you to, for you to consider coming up forward. Come out here. We'll pray together. You can commit your life to Jesus. <coughs> Or recommit your life to Jesus. All of us need to do that once in a while. All of us need to do that very time. So friends, whatever your story is, whatever, whatever experiences you may have had, I want to encourage you that we are believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He loves us, that He's come on this earth to restore our relationship with our Heavenly Father, and for us to accept that gift. To understand that gift, to acknowledge that gift. And when we participate in communion here, it's very important for us to remember that he sacrificed himself. His body was literally broken. It was, it was, he went through a very painful kind of death. His blood was spilled. And you know the thing is, his sacrifice was enough to forgive every single sin of every single person in this room in the past. In the present, and you know what? In the future, when you mess up, when you screw up, when you sin, it was enough for that as well. We are to come to Him as children, asking for forgiveness and to have a restored relationship with our Heavenly Father. Do you have that today? If you have that today, that's what this communion symbolizes. If you don't have it, I would encourage you not to participate and fix your relationship with God. Fix your relationship with that other person. Might be in this room or might not be in this room. Friends, a symptom of a relationship with God being restored is how we relate to one another. If we're at peace with God, we'll be at peace with one another. And if we're not going to be at peace with God, you can say all the right things, you can try to do all the right things, you are not going to be at peace with one another. And so I'd like to ask the brothers who are going to be participating in the communion table to go ahead and come forward and prepare. But everybody else, I would like you to go ahead and stand up. Let's spend the next couple of minutes in reflecting, thinking. Let God speak to you and convince your heart. We will participate in communion. We will have a song after that. And during that one song, if God's speaking to you today, if you'd like to commit or recommit your life to Him today, I would encourage you not to put off the most important decision you can make in your life. We're talking about eternity. The way you spend your life here, how you spend and who you trust will determine where you and I will spend the eternity. Let us reflect on this.